Um, and the. Um, 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 get um, um, get um, 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 Oh no. <laughs> to the god Mithras. Neil, today, only. No, that's rubbish. That's rubbish. I'm useless. Come on. It sounds like I'm doing my universal animal call. That's different. That's cute. Starting the nap, does it? Starting with a Roman fort. But it's actually going to. No, no, no. What am I talking about? Because we can tell you now, categorically, if you pour fresh orange juice over the top of your head, <laughs> you won't feel sticky afterwards. The worship of Mithras became hugely possible. And I got the bottle out and I put, or at least I thought, I put my thumb on the top of the bottle. I can still feel that, that cold splash <laughs> <laughs> striking the top of my head quite firmly, drenching my head. Welcome everybody to the Bakery Bears video show and you join us at a very exciting moment because over the years Yes. We are delighted to have done a number of scientific tests on your behalf. Right. Yes, looking back over the years, I remember the, the great kettle test that we did. Yes. The question was, yeah. was it worth purchasing a more expensive kettle or getting the cheap one which you've always bought? Yes. We bought a more expensive one. Yes. We timed... <laughs> How long each kettle took to boil? And we discovered that the more expensive one boiled, I think it was about 45 seconds faster, which if you then calculated it out over the year of the amount of times that you make a cup of tea, and yes, we did work it out specifically. Did we? We realized so sad. that we'd given ourselves the gift of time. Yes. We, I think over the course of our lives, we've worked out that we have, we're, we're gonna spend one year or something less Stood by stood the kettle. waiting for the kettle. And I'm delighted. Yes, we're back with a brand new test. Because we can tell you now, categorically, if you pour fresh orange juice over the top of your head, <laughs> you won't feel sticky afterwards. Oh, gosh. Now, isn't that a problem that all of us have faced in our lives? This was hilarious. This was hilarious. So we buy, when we go to Booth's supermarket, you know we always go on about Booth's supermarket. When we go there, you can buy freshly squeezed orange juice. So they've got a machine with oranges in, you yeah. press a button, it squeezes the oranges, you put your um, orange juice in a bottle and all is lovely. So we always buy quite a big one, don't we? Do. We? we do. And Bryony had had some for a breakfast yeah. that particular day. She's quite protective over it. We were in the kitchen. We were just about to do some Lego, no, I think, no, weren't no, we? No. I'll, were, I'll what, tell you what exactly what was going on. What were we doing? We were in the kitchen. We were mid-Lego. It was yeah. quite stressful. <laughs> oh, it I needed, was. We were on a tricky bit of Lego. I needed some sustenance. <laughs> so you've got two choices. You reach for the sweets. Bad choice. No, or don't. you go for the fresh produce like freshly squeezed orange juice. I thought, perfect, that's what I need. A little drinky yep. of freshly squeezed orange juice. Yep. So over, I walked to the fridge and I got the bottle out and I put, or at least I thought, I put my thumb on the top of the bottle. And I on then- the, On the lid. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. And then I, I proceeded to, in, in one movement, I, mean, I hope you're impressed, in one movement, I shut the door and shook the bottle. I mean, how impressive is that? Talk about multitasking. Shut what door? They say the door of the fridge. Oh, right. So I did that and that shook just shuts at the same by time. itself, that But stuff. look, I shut the fridge door and I shook at the same time. I mean, just superb. The problem was this. I did not have my thumb on the top of the bottle. <laughs> Me and Brian didn't know what, all we heard was sort of like a dripping noise. Like a sort of... Well, I'll tell you what happened, and right? We, we didn't, we had no clue, and Dan was just stood there like this. And we couldn't tell what had happened. Me and Bryony were looking at him going, and then it dawned on us what he'd done, and he was dripping in orange juice. It was the most amazing thing, oh because... Oh my God, we because could not stop laughing. Thought I had the thumb on top of the bottle, had not, shook it, top flew off, and a, a huge proportion 
of orange juice flew up into the air. Yeah, onto your head. And it literally, it flew up. It did not hit me on the way up. <laughs> Just went psh. It only hit me coming down. It landed. I can still <laughs> feel it now. I can still feel that, that cold splash <laughs> <laughs> striking the top of my head quite firmly, drenching my head, and drenching it's dripping my upper body. dripping off your face like this. Not a door. drop on my jeans. Nothing on your jeans, no. So, now, most of you would be concerned, wouldn't you, like me, that for the rest of the day, you'd you be would really be... really sticky. You'd be sticky to you things. You did wash your head on, it, under the tap you'd kind be like of thing. Clark W. Griswold in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, where you're sticking to everything yeah. after he's had the yeah. sap issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I washed my hands, I took my shirt off, straight in the wash, didn't apply any water mm. to my upper body. <laughs> I only don't think they need to know. That. I only <laughs> I only just stuck my head under the tap. Absolutely fine. No and stickiness. To, I do have to say my hair has felt quite lustrous <sighs> and shiny since. Get on. And we said it's probably, although there's obviously natural sugars in orange juice, because it's just purely squeezed orange juice, there was no added no. Nonsense that they can sometimes put Says in a lot, doesn't things. it? Says a lot. Um, but we did have to mop the floor. You did mop it, and it, but it was still... I mopped it twice, and then you mopped it properly. I had to mop it again, yeah. <laughs> Look, happy Easter, everybody. Yes, we hope you had a great time. If you've been celebrating Easter, I hope you yeah. had the best time ever. We have indeed been having a lovely time. Yeah. And the, the best way, I've discovered the best way to celebrate Easter is on Good Friday to go out and record oh, you did. a brand new Walking the Wall. Oh my goodness, yeah. the roads were perfection, barely saw a soul, mm. weather conditions perfect. Yeah. There was even a man selling coffee in one of the car parks. Couldn't believe it, Dan texts me, he's like, oh my word, I've just had a fresh coffee. And I'm like, how on earth yeah, have no. you managed to have that? Only. And there's an amazing coffee man the, in a car park. It's the only place I think that you could go where this would happen. And it's because tourists do tend to hit yeah. specific spots. Yeah. And I just yeah. happen to be coming through a, a particular area which has got a history of being quite popular. So there he was. I was like Roadrunner. Yeah. Can it was you like imagine? dust. I was like there. I'm like, this is just the lift I needed, I thought. It was mm. marvellous. So, halfway through filming, just brilliant. That means, of course, walking the wall is back. Oh, yes. And what a walk we have in store. As this series wow. progresses, it's going to get wilder and wilder. And after hinting, tempting you with a 200 foot of wall in the last wall, this time, yeah, it's nearly a hundred percent more. It's brilliant. I've watched it, and it's it's really great. There's lots of you. I'm, I'm hoping you realised on the the last one that Dan put in a reconstruction of what that section looked like. I was like blown away when I saw that. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It's like watching Time Team or something. But he's done lots of that in this episode, lots of those reconstructions. It's just amazing. I didn't know how he'd done it. I was just, like I said, I was blown away when I saw it last time because it, to me, it, it was like I was watching a prop, I say proper. I don't mean that in any derogatory way at all. You know what I mean? I'm watching an actual TV program is what I meant. I think because we've really been pushing the boundaries with this show, I so appreciate the fact that Kay always tells me it like it is, yeah. which is great. It's one of the, to be fair, we do w w with each other, which I think is such an important yeah. thing. I'll design something and I'll just say, is this total rubbish to Dan? And if and it is, and it, it has is, been it, at times, I say yes. It'll say yes. Similarly, it's absolute rubbish. It, it, Kay has at many times, you know, over the years said, I think that perhaps wasn't quite as good as it could have been. And so it's always a really nervy, yeah. it's a nervy moment for me w w when she watches. So I was, you know, I was thrilled that, that you, you no enjoyed notes it. No notes this time? <laughs> yeah, she she said to me, will you watch it back and give me notes? And I said you to do. Him, She does every time. I do, I do, yes. I do. And there was no notes. Thank goodness there's something good here to watch at Easter. Because oh, let me tell you, know. when Kay looked at the TV guide... I said to Dan it was Easter, it was Saturday, it was a, so it was the Saturday before Easter Sunday. And we were talking when we were eating tea and I said, oh, what, you know, what things were on the telly that you remember on Easter Sunday that you used to watch? And I said, well, normally I remember sitting and eating an Easter egg and either watching The Wizard of Oz or The Sound of Music. You know, there was always like a big film on and I said oh do you know what let's all guess what film is going to be on between channels one and five so these are the main five channels aren't they here in the UK and we were all completely wrong and we all guessed a film we said look across those five channels let's guess what film is going to be on 
over Easter Sunday sort of afternoon, early evening. And I looked at the schedule to see what was on the telly on, you know, through channels one to five on Easter Sunday. And there was, I think, only one film over the sort of, you know, uh, early afternoon going into early evening. And it was the Ten Commandments, I think it was, on Channel 5. Other than that, it was all sport and something with Michael Ball in it. And there was no film apart from, I think, The Lion King was on BBC One later on at, like, half past six or something. What has happened, people? What has happened? Everybody streams. I know, but how sad is that? Because, no, that's not true. Not everybody streams. Because what about, like, the more elderly population? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but clearly... Um, there the, are still people who don't programmers. have... programmers. You know, because it costs money to have all of these things, doesn't it? Apple TV and all the rest of it. So there are people that are, are missing out, I think, who just probably want to put the telly on... on Easter Sunday and watch a film and there was nothing. We've got you covered, thank goodness. Yes. But before we can get to that, there's a lot to get to. Oh my goodness. Because, oh yes, I finished something. Dan has finished something. There's a Everybody? special Easter treat. So in what's off your needles, you'll be taking a look at my marvellous finished objects. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's two of them. Oh, get on. You can't count it as two. Kay's also cast on something amazing. Yep. Oh, yes. Two things new, actually. I've now successfully managed to cast on another garment after I showed you my oh, failed yeah, attempt before. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> got into a bit of that, which is good, and the yarn is growing on me. So I think without further ado, it's time for me to ask Kay Jones, what's on your needles? Well, the first thing I'm knitting is something, the type of thing I'm knitting is something that I haven't knit for ages. And the little backstory behind this project in my lovely Eldenwood craft bag, I love this bag is um so Bryony is as you know we've mentioned she's shortly going to be starting her GCSEs and her kind of least favorite subject and the one that she really has to work the hardest at is maths and the last time we had a sort of teacher parent conferency thing we were talking to a maths teacher and her maths teacher mentioned something that Bryony took into school one time and how she loved this little thing. I said to her, I said to her maths teacher, I said, look, if Bryony gets this particular grade, you know, it was actually one up from the sort of pass grade, because she is pass, her grade at the moment is indicating she's going to pass. But we said, okay, I, I said to her, look, if she, if she gets this particular grade, I will make you one of those things. So, and she was like, oh my gosh, that's so kind. But me being me, I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to make it for her anyway and give it to her anyway. And the thing that Bryony took into school that day was this little fella. So cute. This is a free pattern, actually. It's called, I had to write it down because I just keep forgetting. It's called A Little kind Kindness Monster by Rachel Borello. And she designs under Yarnigans. It's a, like I say, it's a free pattern on Ravelry. And I've made a few of these in the past, actually. Bryony's got this one. I made one as a gift, I think, for someone too. So I've made two or three of them in the past. Super, super cute little fella. So I thought I am gonna make one anyway for Bryony's maths teacher because she's helped her a lot and she's, you know, she's a really good teacher. And we really appreciate that, especially in this subject that Bryony, like I said, has to work really hard at. I thought, yeah, I'm going to make a one. So <laughs> this took much thinking about because whenever I'm making something for anyone, even something as it's not a piece of clothing or anything like that. But all I could think was, well, I don't know this woman and I don't know what sort of colours she likes. So I thought, oh, how do I know what colours to make it? What if I make it in a colour that she absolutely detests? And then I just said, look, stop being so silly. Just make it in whatever colours you want to make it, and I'm sure she'll really like it. So what I decided to do was, the, the pattern is for, I think it's like a DK or worsted weight, but in theory you can knit it in any, whatever weight you want, as long as you get a nice dense fabric, you can knit it in whatever weight you want. This is, I believe this was a DK, and then the hat is a Cascade 220 I think, so it's sort of a DK worsted weight. I knit this one and I can't remember what that blue yarn is at all. 
So I did, what I decided to do, because I wanted to make this really special, I wanted to knit it in some yarn that I dyed. I thought that would make it even more special. And I didn't really have much DK weight that I've dyed. So I thought, well, I'll just hold fingering weight double and that, you know, that will work out. So that's what I'm doing and it is working out brilliantly well. So I went through my stash and I thought, right, let's just try and find a colour that won't be offensive to anyone. I know that sounds, this is so silly, isn't it? That this is the sort of things I think about. But I, I came across this colour. I don't think this had a name. It was just a one of a kind. So it's sort of browns and oranges. But I just thought, mm, that's, I don't know that anybody would really hate that, if you know what I mean, with the colours in there. So I'm holding that double for the body. And then for the hat, thought what colour would contrast well with that and I, I think this looks okay you can tell me but I'm holding these two double this top one the pink is hubba bubba that I've dyed on the show and then the bottom one is one that I called I think it was sugar plum fairy such a pretty shade of like violet I love that colour so I'm holding those two double just to make a more sort of variegated colour and I'm nearly finished I've only got the arms and legs to do and I've done the hat, but I'll show you what it looks like without the hat. Oh, it's kind of cute. So look, oh, hello. Oh my goodness, how cute am I? Oh, that's really sweet. So the minute it looks kind of rabbitish, doesn't it? Looks like a little rabbit, sort of. I don't think it's meant to be any kind of particular creature. It's just a little thing, isn't it? And so the... The eyes are safety eyes and they're 12 millimeter, which is what the pattern recommended, 12 millimeter eyes, and I did have some luckily. And then the mouth, gosh, it took me ages to do the mouth yesterday, didn't it? I was fiddling yeah. about with it for ages. And the way I did the the past the previous one on here, if I hold it close, I used just some embroidery floss, all six strands held together, and I used split stitch. So I did that again on this one and I think it worked out okay. It's a little bit wonky, the smile, but I think that just adds to the character, I think. Mm. And the ears are super cute. So I've got the hat as well, I made the hat, here it is. And you can see the holes there to poke the ears through. Now I haven't actually put the hat on the head yet. What I did, I think the trickiest thing with making toys is the finishing. And you can knit the pieces as neat as you possibly can knit them. But if your finishing is not, you know, just right, I think it, it to me, you know, it can not spoil it, but you know, I, I just think finishing is really key. And what I decided to do with this, because the pattern is a free pattern and it's a great pattern, but it doesn't have a lot of specific details about how to do the finishing. It just says, sew the ears to the top of the head. Which, bearing in mind, they've got to fit through the gaps in the holes in the hat that you've knit. That can be, a you know, you can think, well, how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna position them so that they're gonna fit through those holes in the hat? And when I made this one, I remember I just sort of guessed a bit and they're not quite in the right position. So the hat sort of, you have to keep jiggling with it to make it fit properly. So what I did this time was I knit the hat before the ears and then I put the hat on the sort of earless head and where the holes were for the ears, I just sort of reached through with a locking stitch marker and just marked the position of where that was. Took the hat off and then I knew that that was the position I had to put the ears. So hopefully they are in about the right position. So I'll put the hat on and we'll see what happens. It's harking back to really what took you back to knitting really is is knitting toys it and is. also perfecting toys i mean that really is where it i is. suppose that's where everything began for me with with knitting really well um probably for us yeah absolutely and i've i've got some stuff here that i'm going to just show you in a second clearly it appealed to, to you getting it right Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I am a detail person. You know, I do like to get the details right. And, you know, that can sometimes take a bit of time and I don't mind that. I'd rather 
I'd rather spend the time and get something right than rush through it. But yeah, look. Oh, <gasps> how cute is that? I think that works, doesn't it? What do you think? Yeah. I still am tempted to just put a couple of tacking stitches so that the hat doesn't come off the head but then of course you can't take it on and off but I doubt that she will be taking the hat on and off I'm just tempted really because it does that's the only thing I would say that you know that it does this just wants to come off and it doesn't really fit as well as it should I mean if to be honest I, what I would you know if I had all the time in the world I would probably redesign the hat and put a hat on the head which I thought fit a little bit better but you know it's it's totally fine but I think actually I think this one also fits a bit better because I took the time to wash and block it and I didn't with this and I think what that's done is it's relaxed the yarn and made it easier to sort of mold it onto the head whereas this hat is a bit stiff and really I should just give it a wash, maybe I will do that. But that fits pretty well, I think. And the little ears stick out. So all I've got to do now is the arms and legs, which are just, they're all, there's four of exactly the same thing. And then you just sew them, you know, to the body. And that'll be done. So I'll show you the finished thing next time and then I'll give it to Bryony to give to her teacher. But it got me thinking about the whole toy thing and, you know, it may be that if you are a newer viewer, oh, that's tricky to say, a newer viewer, you might not realise that my and us, really, as we are sitting here, we all came from me knitting a toy for Bryony. Yeah, as we just said it, As we all said, that's where it all came from. So I've actually got out a few of the things that I've made in the past. So I guess it all started with Mrs. Bakery Bear. And here she is. This is the original Mrs. Bakery Bear that was on the pattern. And she still looks great. She's sat on Bryony's shelf all these years. So Mrs. Bakery Bear has a dress and she's got some really sweet little Mary Jane shoes. That's all in the pattern. And a bow in her ear. So the way that I make my toys going back to the finishing is all of the pieces are knit in the round apart from the ears they're just knit flat and the shoes are there is a seam on the shoes as well but the actual body pieces are knit in the round and then I seam everything on so the head is seamed to the body and the arms and the legs and I know that is not the kind of more common way of, of producing toys these days you do tend to get them where you can um, sort of pick up stitches for the arms and the legs and things like that and that does make it easier but I have always found that by seaming things you you just get a much better finish and you know this little bear is now how old? I don't know, seven years, eight years old? I'm not even sure. And she still looks absolutely, to me, she still looks perfect, you know? So that's Mrs. Bakery Bear. There was then a Mr. Bakery Bear, which I couldn't find on Brownie's shelf this morning. It must be hidden under something else. But Mr. Bakery Bear has a cable jumper and some shorts on. And I've then designed Miss Gelato Giraffe. And I've got I've got a tower of giraffes here because Bryony informed me this morning that the collective term, collective noun for giraffes is a tower, which makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So here's Miss Gelato, and Miss Gelato was inspired by Bryony's Goffy. So this one is actually sort of the colours of Goffy. So that's Miss Gelato, and she has a lovely little cardigan. A lovely little giraffey tail there and again she's knitting the round the head actually is part of it sort of comes out of the body that is not a separate piece with this it is one piece so that's Miss Gelato and then my latest one I say latest this was a few years ago but I designed a fox now the fox unfortunately is in a ziplock bag because here he is he's Mr Fitzwilliam Fox Named, of course, after Mr. Darcy, Colin Firth, Mr. Darcy, because that is the only Mr. Darcy. He's in a Ziploc bag because for the past few years he's been living in the kitchen 
And when I picked him up today, I've noticed that his clothes has, have got some holes in. So I'm worried that some bug has crawled in the kitchen and has been eating away at him. So I'm, I've put him in a Ziploc bag and I'm gonna pop him in the freezer just in case there's anything still lurking in there. Bri all of the things that's on Bryony's shelf, I've actually had them all off a shelf recently. There's, are absolutely fine. We don't generally have a problem with moths at all. And I don't think this is necessarily a moth. I'm not sure what's going on, but just for safety, I've popped him in, poor, look at him, poor little fella. But as you can see, he's got a lovely smart cardigan with pockets and he has socks because he's a fox in socks. So yeah, that's where it all started really. But yeah, I'm gonna carry on and finish my little kindness monster. And I'll show you, like I said, I'll show you next time and then I'm gonna give it to Bryony to give to her teacher. So Dan Jones, what's on your needles? It's the jumper which I uh, totally messed up the cast on of before, and this time I haven't. It's not twisting. It's so all lovely. It's all perfect. So uh, it's twisted rib, and the yarn. Oh, what's the yarn again, Kay? I can't um, remember. I can't remember. Rico something. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Rico Essentials. Rico Essentials Super Aaron. There we go. The pattern, unfortunately is one of those crazy names again which is just impossible to pronounce and and there's a number of different translations which i've heard so i'll just put the name at the bottom there for you so that's the name of the pattern which you'll find on ravelry and it is by the same designer who did the anniversary and the alexander and also the radari so the patterns i really understand and, and know you know how to get going with what's different this time is i'm using the square needle so it's the cubics but they're, they're circulars and the initially they were a real pain the the cable was mm. just i mean to be fair it's still a bit of a pain yeah it's not it's got it's not it's got a lot of memory yeah it's certainly got easier now that i've done a little bit yeah which is good the yarn i mean initially like on the cast on edge and then just on the first couple of rows it's really quite it's, it's quite sort of challenging but then once you get a few rows in it's not uh, it, it's starting to feel a bit more normal now which is really cool yeah it's and i suppose a, that's always the case it's a single ply um and it's very sort of loose but if i show you the white ball again can you see it's very loose and it it is quite fuzzy as a result of that so the only thing that bothers me is that it is going to be incredibly pilly i'll just depill it if it is pilly in a, you see in an ideal world i would have got you to knit it in let lopi because i love the look of let lopi but i just can't wear it and i, I did I, I went onto the yarn sub website you know i'm sure that you've all used that and i put in let lopi and i looked at all the different things that came up and a lot of them weren't available to me here in the UK. But this one was, and there was another, oh, Malabrigo Worsted was another one, and we spoke about that before, didn't we? We were thinking about that one, um, but decided against it. And this is sort of similar to that in that it's a single ply, but this isn't all wool, it's a 50-50 wool acrylic. And it's very light, which I like, but th that is the only thing that bothers me, you know, that it is going to be a little bit fluffy. You can see in the ball it's fluffy already, isn't it? I, I think it definitely will be. I know. I just don't... I'm I'm not keen on jumpers that look really worn and pilly before I've, they've even been worn. And that can sometimes be the case, can't it, depending on the yarn. So I would have loved it to have been in Let Lope. I just wish there was... If anybody knows, please comment and tell us. But if there's a substitute for Let Lope that's not really um, prickly and really scratchy... And I know people say, you know, soak it in conditioner and do all of that. And I, I do do that to Dan's. And I have tried on one of Dan's jumpers. I tried it on, you know. But, but, and, look, look at that, um, though. It's very soft. Well, I mean, and it looks, if, if it looks you... great. But look, there's a bit hanging off down there already, look. But it, it I mean, it looks really nice, doesn't it? It's, so it's you, very you, soft. You, so. you need to look at that and, yeah. and gauge it off the fact that I've just been working that. And I've worked yeah. the yarn quite hard. You so do, this is the thing, you do work the yarn hard. And So my question um, to you is, do you think that that looks okay? If the finished jumper looks like that, are you going to be okay with well, it? Well, yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'll be okay. And the, this is twisted rib, so you, you work in this, the yarn much harder than you will be when you're just plain knitting yeah. or doing colour work. 
I would say that that's a good reflection on how pilly it's going to be. Yeah. Just because of the fact that I'm working the yarn quite hard. Yeah, yeah. And I like, can't this, an- anticipate. And it, looks, it looks fine. I think it looks fine, doesn't it look? I was quite surprised, actually, at how it came out. It's a lovely colour. I love the colour. I think it's navy, I think this one is. I thought it would look less defined than that. Yeah, it does look quite defined. You're right, it does. So I think what's happening is the yarn is sort of squishing, isn't it? I've gone from being quite sceptical about this yarn to being definitely yeah. more positive. Because the other thing we did when you recast on is we went up a needle size, didn't we? Yeah. You were using four and a half. When we did swatch, Yeah. but you were using four and a half millimetre. But you said to me that it just, everything felt really tight when he was knitting, it just all felt really tight. And I said, you know what, well, that is the yarn telling us that I think you, you need to go up a needle size. And I don't think, because the, the size you're making is like a size smaller than, the Dan Norm, than Dan normally makes for himself. And you like a slim fit jumper. And I did try yours on and we decided, even though I could have worn the, the size of Dan's, because obviously I've got a chest and Dan hasn't. I thought let's go a size smaller so the fact that we've gone up a needle size and we're knitting a size smaller I think that you know that's quite makes me feel quite comfortable doing that. What does it recommend? Oh I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Five. Does that mean five millimeter? Because this is like a European yarn so I don't think that means a US size five needle. Maybe that means five millimeter in which case that's that's right, so. So that's the jumper, perfectly fine, a lot happier with the yarn. Needles, lovely on the ends, the tails are a bit annoying. Tails, the cable, <laughs> we don't like the cable, no. But, but you know, it's fine now, I've got going, and I'm actually quite looking forward to just getting into the plain knitting. Yeah. So, cool. cool. What else is on your needles? Right, oh, I've been working on my prom socks for Bryony. I'm all, well, I'm on the heel flap of the second sock. And I've actually knit through this second sock really quickly, even though it's been a while since I showed you this. I've been working on other stuff and I've just finished a really big design project as well. Yes, I'm halfway through the second prom sock for Bryony. I'll pop the first one on the blocker. This, this hasn't been washed or blocked yet. But this is a pair of socks that I'm knitting for Bryony for her to wear to wear prom. I know that sounds a bit strange, but oh, look. Oh, I love them so much. I explained last time that Bryony's prom this year is the beginning of July and she's got her dress, beautiful. But she's going to be wearing little sort of flat trainery type shoes because she's very tall. She's 5'9", 5'10". She doesn't want to add heels to that. She's not a heel type person at all. She just wants to wear little flat plimsolly trainery things underneath and I said oh well you need some socks to wear don't you because she loves her hand knit socks so that's where these socks came from really so I dyed the yarn which I've shown you how to dye this colourway on the last I think it was the last my favourite colourways and I designed this pair of socks and I'm on sock two and I've just started the heel flap now this this design actually, it seems to, honestly seems to knit itself. I love, absolutely love knitting it. And I think actually what I'm gonna do when I finish this pair is I want to cast on another pair in a self-striping because I think it will look great, this pattern in self-striping. So I really want to do that. And I've got a lovely yarn in mind actually. I'm gonna show you, it's here. Oh, I love this. This is from Mustache and I got it last year, I think. It's a very Hobbit Christmas. <gasps> But look at it, isn't it gorgeous? Oh, can't wait to use that. But yeah, I'm on the heel flap and this just got me thinking about heel flaps. So I've just started it here, you can see. Because there's various ways of knitting the heel flap, isn't there, in terms of how you begin it, I should say. Now, I always knit my heel flap on, to me, what is, as I look at my sock, as I'm knitting it, I always knit my heel flap on the back needle. So it's the sort of second half of stitches, I suppose you would say. And I know that a lot of people start their heel flap on the front stitches. So what that would mean if you start knitting it on the front is that you start with a knit row, whereas I start with a purl row. And the, the reason I like that, there's a few reasons actually. I mean, one, it makes knitting a contrast heel for me really easy. And I've 
shown you how to how I knit a contrast heel in a few of my patterns, but I'll show you how I knit my heel my contrast heels in the vanilla cream sock pattern. But what it means is that, like I say, for me it makes it easy for, to do a contrast heel and not cut the yarn. I don't cut my main colour yarn when I knit a contrast heel. But also what it means is because you're starting with the pearl row, you don't get that um, pearl bump thing that, that can happen. Do you know if you're knitting a contrast heel, if your first row of the contrast heel is slip one, knit one, what it means is you will get a little, what you know, like up and down thing at the top of your heel flap because your first row is a slipped row. Now I know a lot of people are in the pattern I've seen sometimes it'll say that first row you just knit straight across and then you start your heel flap but I find that if you do that that's creating another row and it's just another area where you might get a hole when you're closing the gap. So I've always done it this way where I start the heel on the back stitches so I'm starting with a pearl row and I just find that that works for me it works the best. I do the same on you, my socks. Well you do the same because I taught you. <laughs> Dan, Dan just does whatever I've taught him to do. So you knit the same way as me. Yeah, I know that. But I know but it's I funny, isn't funny. it? Even though even though I I taught you to knit, it could be that then you went on and just dis developed your own style. Which, well, I did with colour work. Yeah, but your actual knitting technique, the way that you hold your yarn, yeah. is the same as me because that's just how I taught him. Yeah. Um, there's no rights or wrongs in these things, is yeah, there? there? Is. <laughs> No, there isn't. Yeah, there is. No, there isn't. It's my way. If it works for you, then it's right, isn't it? That's how I work my heel flaps. And it's my favourite bit of a sock, actually. It's still my favourite bit of a sock, doing the heel flap and the turn. Picking up the stitches is my favourite bit, actually. I love picking up the stitches and closing that gap. And for quite a few years now, I've closed the corner gap in a very particular way. And I'll show you on this completed sock. Can you see the corner here? I hope you can see just how neat that is. So I do it, my pick up in a, a like I say, a, a, a way that, I don't know if it's particular to me, but it's certainly something that came out of my head. And that is in a lot of my patterns now, include that method. You know, the, there are tutorials again in the vanilla cream sock pattern. So these are my prom socks. These will be a design that I'm going to put out as soon as I've got that second one finished and I can get the pattern written up and through testing, then this will be a design that will be forthcoming. Oh, here we go. So here's my two mitts and here's my third mitt. <laughs> and I've actually, I mean, what's really good is, right, I've never knitted colour work mittens like this before. This was the first time no, you that this pair. And it's been a learning curve because on the first mitt, I'm, I made some mistakes. I missed, I sort of lost track a couple of times. I don't know. But I totally nailed the, the thumb gussy. Yeah. You know, got that exactly right and nailed the Latvian braid and I mean, <laughs> It was only when I got into the, the, the chart itself that I just got a bit confused just because I'd not knitted from a chart quite like that before. Mm. It just felt different. It felt completely new to me. But I was messing up. Well, I wasn't messing up. I hadn't sort of perfected my gauge. I wasn't catching the float quite enough. Now, here I've gone the other way because I've made some mistakes as well. Have you? Yeah, but I shouldn't show you. Well, I didn't notice. So yeah, we've got two, basically what we've got is two identical <laughs> mittens. Now, what I've done on this mitt, yeah, I see. And know. we're keeping the second one, aren't we? And we're considering that the first one was a practice piece because the second one is much better, I think. It is much better, but I'll tell you, I see. No, you don't have to point out your mistakes because I didn't notice, you don't have to do okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. So I won't point out my mistakes. No, you but don't all need I will, to. All I will say to you is this. I have learnt a huge amount again from the knitting of this mitt and that has been largely through the technique of carrying your yarn at certain points within the mitt. I, I won't go into too much detail because if I do then I'll point out where the issues are. It looks lovely. <laughs> but put it this way, I've learnt so much going from this to this to now this. 
So I'm feeling so much more And we're more doing it confident. correctly this we time. We are doing it correctly, but You're what doing I... You're doing right mitt, aren't you? Because I've got a left one. I don't one. know. I've got another left one. We don't want another left one, do we? What, what I established is this. Whilst this pattern is perfectly clear and everything's lovely about the pattern, there's no chart for the right mitt. No. And this is a paid-for pattern. Yes. And that creates challenges because... It does. Because... What you have to do... Oh, it's okay, I can see what... Uh, my, my, my washi tape's ripped off some of my chart, <laughs> but that's okay. What you have to do is you have to reverse... Yeah, it just you tells have, you, you have to, to knit, reverse it. You have to knit in the opposite direction, but also as well, your increases are obviously... You're doing the opposite. Yeah. So whilst I, if I look at the chart, that tells me to make one left. It's not to make one right. Yeah. You see, I, I, think, it, I think it's a paid-for pattern. It, you should have both mitts, left and right, charted separately. I honestly really do think Because that. also, as well, aren't charts always read from right, right to left? Right to left. So to then to yeah, suddenly always say... Always read right to left. How many people, I'm sure loads of people... Unless would, it's knit flat and then you're knitting it like right. that, aren't you? You would guess... This is not flat. You would guess that most people would, after knitting the pattern from right to left, just suddenly have to go from left to right, yeah. you're having to sort of rejig your brain a bit. You are, and if, you know, it could be that, you, you, really to be able to do, if that that could have flummoxed a very new knitter. And okay, you might say, <laughs> it, well you it, might say it flummoxed that, me. You might say that somebody who is knitting these won't be a very new knitter, but it could be the first time that you've knit, for example, a gusset on a mitten. It might be that you've never done that before, but that you're quite experienced with colour work. So you might think that you've got that experience. But I think just saying to just, you know, when it's just to switch it, just do it in the opposite direction. I think, honestly, I do think that that should have been charted. Yes. And the other thing I noticed, and maybe this is just... I think what, this is the style. I, then maybe this is just the style of this sort of mitt. But one thing I've noticed is that, can you see, it's sort of skewing to one side. Can you see how the, the edge stitch here, it doesn't seem to want to sit right on the edge. It seems to want to go round like that. I wonder that. if after it, they've been blocked, if that might fix it. I mean, maybe so. And I just wonder if it's the positioning of the thumb gusset, because you can see here, my, that's where my thumb is, but there's all this sort of room here and my thumb is actually over here on the edge. So I'm I'm not sure at the moment about how the fit, the finished fit is going to be. It'll be lovely. Um, you're going to block sure them it, and I'm, they're going to fit great and when you're out doing your walks this yeah, winter you'll have these very, on. I'm sure they'll be very You'll be warm. so happy. Yeah, well I'm, I will darling, yes. I'm just, you know. You walk past people and they'll point at your mittens and they'll give you a thumbs up. Will they? Do you think they will? I'll go, look at my mittens, everybody. My husband made them. <laughs> so this is what I've done on the right mitt. Yes. And I was initially a bit perturbed about having to do the alternating twin colour cast on again. Yeah. But actually, I'm really glad I did because now I've done it three times mm. and I'm feeling much more confident with it, which is good. And I'm sort of looking forward to have, having to do the backwards loop again <laughs> because that's the one where I really couldn't get it into my head just mm. because it, I, I, I convinced myself it was harder than it was. I'm still but worried about picking up from that edge. I don't, we'll right. I'm not convinced it's gonna be very neat. We'll but, be all right. You know, we'll give it a best shot. We'll be fine. Yeah. So these are the star mitts, but again, they're, it's a foreign word. Yeah, it's Veronica so Forsberg. They're linked in the show notes below. Yes. And the, the pattern is perfectly clear. Yeah. You know, the charts are perfectly clear. It's just a bit frustrating about the reversing thing. Yeah, I Slightly agree. sort of blew my mind I agree, touch. I agree. But you know, at least I know what I'm doing now and I'm into the chart. So, you know, I've done all that and I'm into the chart and I'm knitting it correctly. But of course, making sure, because how easy would it be to pick it up? And just do... And just start going from the wrong direction. Very easy. Can you yeah, imagine? Very you easy. might knit like four, oh no, yeah. why does it look right? I've been yeah. going from the wrong direction. Mm, mm. Maybe I need to put, put a, a massive... Put a little asterisk or yeah, something yeah. on that a side. A huge arrow yeah. on the left. Cool. What else is on your needles? Oh, so... The last thing I'm working on the last is... The but by far the most exciting. ...is a new pair of socks for Dan. 
Yay! <laughs> and I did, I didn't I moan last time about finishing those socks for him? And what have I done? I've cast on another pair. But the difference is I chose to cast on this pair. I chose the yarn. I chose how I'm knitting them. It's all lovely. <laughs> yeah, well, my advice to you is win, knit or forfeit this year. Well, thanks very much for that advice. That's okay. I'll try my best. Now, I've put these into a very but old bag. <laughs> Newsflash, the toe on the socks is oh, great. Yeah, I modified the toe. If you remember when I showed you Dan's finished socks last time, I modified the toe. The socks are also very sucky, which I really like. Oh, right, okay, that's good. But I did a, a longer toe. It was my umbrella toe, but I just modified it. They seem to be doing well, don't they? So I did write that down, so I can do that now for all future socks. But these particular socks I'm working on now for Dan are in a very old bag from Tangerine Designs. I don't know even if Tangerine Designs are still in existence. But I remember, oh, it's years ago I bought this. I was so proud when I bought this because it came from America. It's probably one of the first purchases I ever made from America. And I just love it and I still use it, you know. still It's still a perfectly perfect bag. And the theme perfectly of the bag, perfect perfectly bag. perfect bag, like Mary Poppins, the theme of the bag... Yeah, what is the theme, Kay? I, I, I've, uh, I've always wondered. Yeah, not very clear, is it? No. But that's a huge clue as to the socks. Oh, is it? Ooh, have it I is. seen these? Yes, you have seen these. And I've got something in here that I need to decide on. There we go. Oh, and I've got in here my little... I keep a little sort of like sock... Not even a journal. It, just whenever I'm making a pair of socks I just keep a note of how I've made them so uh, you know cast on number needles that I've done number of rows for the rib number of rows for the leg if I've put in a stitch pattern because then I've, I've got a reference point if those particular socks Dan comes to me and says oh they fit really great or I really like the length of that or whatever then I've, I can just look back and duplicate it for him so this little book actually I love it. it's a Hobonichi <laughs> don't yeah, let's not, let's not start talking about Hobonichi again. But this little book I love, and it's got the squared paper, which is perfect for, you know, popping in a little chart or anything. But literally, look, I just put a little few notes there on what I'm doing. So that's really good. I'll put that back in. So I'm, oh, where's my ball band? There it is. I'm knitting, just talking about moustache, I just showed you the hobbity one. Yes, talking of moustache yarn before, this yarn I'm using is also a moustache yarn. And it's Stacey's um, Yoda colourway. I know that she had, I think she had to sort of rename all of her Star Wars yarns. I don't know if there was some issue with copyright going on, but this one is called Defender of the Home Tree, aka Yoda. And it's a perfect must match set. So I'd forgotten this actually, but when I came to wind it, I'd forgotten that I get two 50 gram balls that are perfectly matched. So I thought, great, I'm going to knit these at the same time. I don't do two duvets. at a time. What? I don't do what? We don't do duvets. <laughs> don't do duvets. Who said that? That was Trevor and Simon on Going Live Gosh. in the 1990s. And they didn't do duvets? It was a... They were actually very funny. It was like a sketch show. Yeah, a bit I like, never found It was like Morkman Wise or the two Ronnies. That's why I didn't find them very And they, funny. they did it sort of within Going Live with Philip Schofield and Sarah oh, Green. Right. And one of the sketches they did, they worked in a bedding shop or oh, something or other. Right, okay. And people would come in and ask for a duvet. Right. And they would say, oh no, oof, we don't do duvets. <laughs> well, duvets are really a quite a modern invention, aren't they? Previous to that, not it anymore. Was I mean, depends. Depends what you call and modern. Eider downs, wasn't it? I remember my mum bringing home my first duvet. Yeah, so that's quite modern, darling. It's not that long ago. It isn't, but it is. Well, no, it's not. Not in terms of like. It is compared. If you were talking the to the time out of daughter, time that people have had to existed get warm. No, that's true. But sheets probably are quite modern. <laughs> sheets are quite modern. Yes. No, cotton, I don't think so. sheets. no, I don't think so because in Little House on the Prairie they had sheets, even though their mattresses were like filled with. But in the history of the hay world, straw, in the history of the world, sheets. Little House on the Prairie is not that long ago. No, I suppose not. 
I suppose going back in history when we were... We were sleeping under wool. We were, we were, no, we weren't under wool. We were under animal skins. Yes. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah. Don't bother with your duvets anymore. Just go out and purchase yourself some a bear sheep, skins. A sheepskin. <laughs> a sheepskin, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that back would feel to... quite 1970s, wouldn't it? It probably would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Ayla used to do, because ah, as we know, as we know, Ayla has the answer to everything. She dug a depression in her cave. She kind of scooped out a depression in the earth and then lined it with sort of grass, uh, dried grass. And then she would put a fur on the bottom. Yeah. And then she would have a fur on top. Yeah. Lovely. So that, that was her duvet. Right, so back to my socks. Yeah. The Yoda socks. So because I'd got two 50 gram balls, I'm knitting them both at the same time, but on separate needles. I don't do two at a time on the same needle. In all honesty, I've never tried the technique, but I, I know I wouldn't like it. So, I'd, you know, I'd, normally I, I would always try something like the tiny nine inch circulars. I've tried those a few times now. And quite recently, I tried them again. It's just not for me. Likewise, with two at a time, I've never tried it because I just know it's not. it wouldn't be my thing. So I'm knitting them on two separate magic loop needles, but together at the same time. So I'll show you the one that's a little bit further on. These are going to be shorty socks because Dan really loves shorty socks in the summer and that's the season we're sort of coming into now. And I love the way the yarn's knitting up. Look. How fun is that? So you get the kind of stripey thing here, which I think is meant to be Yoda's lightsaber. You told me it's green, would that be right? Yeah. And then this sort of variegated bit, I think this is meant to represent his clothes, you know, and his colouring, because he's like a greenish colour, isn't he? So normally for Dan's shorty socks, I would do 15 rounds of rib, which is what I've done, and then 30 rounds on the leg. Now I got to this point here, which is the end of the sort of brown bit here, and now it's going to switch to the green variegated. So I counted how many rows I've got here, and I've got 29, or 28, 29 I think. I'm just a, a smidge short of where I would normally be. But I'm stopping at that point because if I don't, I've got to knit through all of this section, because I, I don't want to end the heel halfway through this variegated section because that looks a bit funky then when you pick up for the heel. I, I like it to look as neat as possible. So these are going to be a tad shorter than your shorty socks normally are but they're still four inches. I've measured them. That's four inches which I think is fine for a, a shorty sock. So that's the first one and the second one is here. So I'm now working the second one to the point of the heel flap and then I will, I'm taking it in turns on them so that at the end I'll have two finished socks pretty much at the same time, which will be a bonus. I did take a long time <laughs> making sure that where I started was the same point because although you you know they are perfectly matched so you could actually just start from the point of where the yarn is i wanted that it was like a little bit into the variegated section and i wanted to start the cuff on the brown so that it looked neat again so i had to just pull off it wasn't even that much it was like this it wasn't very much but then I had to make sure that I started them both at exactly the same point and I, it might be about three or four stitches different so I'm living with that. So now I've got to decide what colour heel flap to do because I'm putting in a heel flap because that's the best fitting for Dan. And I've got these yarns from, these came as part of a set actually from the wool barn but they all kind of match but I think I think the green would be too much green if I hold that up I just think that's too much green going on I think the creamy color might be too much cream so I think I might go for this brown perfect which although it's not a perfect match to the brown I think it's close enough yeah and I think it will look good and it's the same base exactly cool. so that will work so I'm um, that's what I'm going to do I'm just working my way through these, just a lovely plain vanilla sock, really lovely, two and a half millimetre and I'm using Addy Sock Rockets or whatever they're called in this country for these and I'm really enjoying the needles. Who's ready for another walk 
in Northumbria. Yes. This is a walk I've been looking forward to all series. I told you in the first episode that this series is going to be a bit like a book. It's going to start steadily and then it's going to work up to great excitement. This is one of those chapters where things really start to fall into place. Oh yes, because not only is there 1,509 feet of amazing Hadrian's Wall, literally as far as the eye can see, but there's watchtowers, there's mile castles, and there is the rarest of all archaeological finds, certainly in the UK, Roman temple. Oh yes. So let's sit back, relax, and enjoy another walk in the wall. Welcome everyone to Northumberland. This is perhaps my favourite county in all of England. Rolling hills make some absolutely wonderful vistas and, and gorgeous landscapes to look out on and scattered in between those hills are some of the most unique and unforgettable little villages. In this series, over seven walks, we're exploring Hadrian's Wall, the epic monument built by the Romans nearly 2,000 years ago to mark the edge of their vast empire. And my goodness, they did an amazing job because already in this series, we've discovered the vast Vallum Hadriani. This was the ditch which protected the south side of the 73 mile wall, which stretched from coast to coast. We've also had our first glimpse of Hadrian's Wall and we've seen the spectacular site that was Chester's Roman fort. This time, we're back for another walk along the Hadrian's Wall path. And for the first time in this series, Hadrian's Wall path has actually got a wall to go with it and it's pretty impressive. Don't believe me? Just take a look. Yes, in today's show, we're gonna be hiking along one of the most photographed sections of this absolutely amazing monument. We're gonna be taking in mile castles, we're gonna be visiting watchtowers, and with a bit of luck, we might even find a Roman temple. This is gonna be quite the walk. Welcome to Walk in the Wall. Adrian's Wall Country. Now we've moved about eight miles from the site of our last walk. We're two miles north of the village of Newborough and we're getting ready for what might be the most exciting walk of the series so far. We're starting our walk today on the site of Broccolicia Roman Fort. It doesn't get much more exciting than that, does it? But actually it does, because on route today, we should get a glimpse of one of the most exciting stretches of wall in all of Northumberland. Of all the sites you'll see along Hadrian's Wall, this has to be one of the most photographed. Why you ask? Well, it's because there's 1,509 feet of beautifully preserved wall and what I'm told are just some 
outstanding views because we've climbed quite a lot now. If you think about it, in this series, we've already discovered the wall, we've visited two forts, we've seen the Vallum, we've also had a close look at the defensive ditch that used to sit in front of the wall. But what we've not discovered is all the way along the wall, every third of a mile, there was either a watchtower or a mile castle. And today we're going to take in a, a mile castle, but also probably one of the most famous watchtowers along all of, all of Hadrian's Wall, and that was Black Cart's Turret. But we're starting our walk, we're, we're parked right at a Roman fort, and I think it would be crazy before we ventured out into the wilderness not to actually go and have a little look at what I think is an absolutely fascinating looking place. This is a place I have always wanted to visit. And the reason being is that road right there, because that road is the road that you go down to get to anything on Hadrian's Wall. So to get there, you have to drive past here. And as soon as you see that car park that we've just left, you know, it's like Christmas Eve. You know, it's nearly time for the fun and games to begin. But do you know what the crazy thing is? The fun and games have already begun. And how often do we say this? We drive past so many amazing things because I'm walking straight through the middle of a site of a three and a half acre Roman fort. This once would have been the heart of a bustling little town with barracks and commander's blocks and there was baths here as well and it would have been really quite a substantial place. Now thanks to General Wade's military road, which is the road that we use to get to all the amazing things on Hadrian's Wall, he's robbed out all the stone so there's nothing left. But thanks to the, the ditch which surrounds this fort, we can still see where this fort, one of the most important forts on all of Hadrian's Wall, once stood. The really interesting thing about this fort is excavations have shown that it was an afterthought. This was not one of the originally planned forts which stood when the wall was first finished. Now, you might be wondering, 2,000 years later, how could we possibly know that? Well, they've dug around here extensively over the years and what they found was that the Vallum, do you remember the Vallum that we saw at Onham Fort on the very first walk that we did? We saw the Vallum move outwards to give space for the fort. Well, here, that doesn't happen. The Vallum carries on straight underneath the fort and when they excavated down, they could see that the Vallum had been filled in and that they built on top of it. Now, I find that absolutely just fascinating that archeologists can dig down and they can tell what's original earth and what isn't. Now, thanks to General Wade stealing all the stone, there really isn't much to see here. But that's not the case on the rest of our walk. Oh no. So I think less procrastinating and let's get out for some more walking the wall. As you've already seen, we've started our walk today back there at Broccolicia Roman Fort. 
and we're now making our way out onto the trail which we've come to know and love so well already in this series. Yes, it's the Hadrian's Wall Path. Now very soon we're actually going to, we're going to turn north and we're going to walk ooh, about half a mile a mile north into what was of course barbarian country. But then we're going to turn east again and we're going to walk parallel. And I've planned this in specifically. We're going to walk parallel to the line of the wall because I've never done that before. And on what is, you know, quite a well-preserved section, I'm hoping that the views, to be fair, towards the wall and actually towards Northumberland and Scotland is just going to be phenomenal. We're then going to come back to the wall. We're going to go visit a watchtower. We're going to have a look at a mile castle. And then we're going to finish off our walk at what I'm hoping is going to be something special because in all the years that I've adored Romans there's one thing that I've never seen and that's a Roman temple so I've saved that for the very end of today's walk here's hoping it's rather lovely right now though it's time for me to enjoy some serious walking Thankfully, the pestilential air doesn't seem to be bothering me today. <laughs> In fact, if this is what pestilential air feels like, I think I'd like some more of it, please. It just goes to show, doesn't it, what happens when you build a wall, because I think that is the last sort of vestiges of Roman propaganda. Because when you put up a wall, it creates division. And in the case of Hadrian's Wall, I actually think it created a country. As we uncovered on our first walk in episode one, when Hadrian's Wall was built, this was just land populated by Celtic tribes. There was no Wales, there was no Scotland, there was no England. When the Romans arrived, they pushed northwards, conquering as they went, until finally they got to this point where they drew that, that line in the sand. Now everything south of the line in the sand, all the Roman bits were called Britannia. And that is of course where we get the name Britain from. Everything north of this land, it was something different. It was a separate country 
and it needed a name. So the Romans gave it one. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Caledonia. Now, if you're like me, you're gonna be wondering, round about now, why is it called Scotland then, and not Caledonia? Well, I shall tell you. Not long after the Romans left, an Irish tribe, Celtic tribe, started coming over to Caledonia and raiding. And they liked it so much over here that gradually over many, many years of coming over and raiding Caledonia, they decided to stay and they stayed, and they settled, and they spread. Now, what was that tribe called? They were called the Scotty. Now, by the time 843 AD came around, which was the year that the country of Scotland was formed, this was already known as, well, not here, it's further north now, because they'd been pushed further north. It was already known as the land of the Scots. So it was pretty obvious that they should call it Scotland. <laughs> And that's what they did when 843 AD, they wanted to form into one country to actually defend against Viking tribes that were coming over and raiding. And they did, they formed their country and they called it Scotland and the rest is history. And to think it all started right here with the building of Hadrian's Wall. As I've already told you a few times in this series, and my apologies for being so over-enthusiastic, but I have a deep affinity with Hadrian's Wall, but also this county. And there's one thing that I'd never done up until we started filming Walking the Wall, and that's walk north of the wall. Now, today's a very special day for me because for the first time ever in my life, I'm walking parallel to the line of Hadrian's Wall. It's crazy that more people don't do this, but the reason being is to get here, you've got to sort of strap on your walking boots and, you know, get going a little bit because over there, you know, a mile and a half in that direction, there's a road and it's easy to get to. But then as soon as you start to come up this way, the tracks get really quite tricky. As soon as you come off Hadrian's Wall Path, you've really got to have your wits about you. What I love about it is, you can see why Hadrian picked that line for the wall because it's naturally on top of what's called the sill. I mean, it's so formidable. Just look at it.
Now, as we progress further through this series, we're going to get more and more remote. Starting with today, actually, there's not much around here at all, apart from Sharply Farm, which we're just coming past. Now, what's interesting about this farm is, because of where we are in the world, there's an awful lot of archaeological work being done in and around this area. And we know that people have been farming here at Sharply for the last 2,000 years. Because just over there, near that tree line, they found the remains of a 2,000 year old Romano-British farmstead. What's so exciting about this section of wall is we really are in John Clayton heartland. Now, if you'll recall, John Clayton was the man we discovered on our last walk, who, after digging in his garden at Chester's and finding a Roman fort, he became obsessed with Roman archeology. span And some of his greatest finds are on this section of wall, and I really can't wait to see them. He must have thought he had the Midas touch, mustn't he? <laughs> he digs in his garden and there's a Roman fort. And then off he goes westward out of his garden and the first patch of land that he buys has got thousand, well, nearly 2,000 foot of absolutely beautiful wall. It's unbelievable, really, if you think about it. But not only that, there's also mile castles, there's watchtowers, and hopefully, a stunning temple. Now I think I'm going to need some sustenance before all that excitement. So you guys head off for a cup of tea and a slice of cake and I'll see you later for more Walking the Wall. an outstanding start oh my goodness walking north is just perfection and i'm so excited to actually do this again on my next walk because we're going to be looking across from the north at housesteads right which i've never done before and i've always sort of gazed down because yeah, you yeah, really are right. gazing down because it's up really high it is high but yeah. this walk i wanted to do it so much because of that lovely unbroken section of wall and it was just amazing to look across mm. and see what would have been quite a sort of imposing and site that was supposed to sort of scare people looking from the north to the to, to the south it today would, it would wouldn't it yeah it absolutely would have been, i'd love to have seen it yeah it would have been amazing Specifically positioning it where they positioned it, it sort of accentuated, you know, it was only a 15 foot high wall, but it was on top of a huge ridge. Yeah. But the thing though that really blew my mind about this is if, as we've just discovered in, in, in that part, had that wall not been built, then perhaps Scotland would never have formed. Mm. Perhaps we would just be one country. Mm. And I just find things like that so utterly fascinating that on the sort of whim of of a dude around about 120 AD right okay we've got to mm. stop now mm. build a wall call it something else yeah it's not part of the empire Caledonia that'll do the Caledonia I live there mm. and the rest as they say is is history literally 
Yeah. But my goodness, on this walk, we're only just getting going because we've not even got to the wall yet. And wait till you see it. I love that farm, though. What about that farm, Yeah, yeah, the farm was brilliant. You just... Yeah. That's what I love about Northumbria. Every, around every corner, it's like there's something there yeah. waiting to be discovered. And because of Hadrian's Wall, there's been so much archaeological work done. Yeah. And so we know so much more about that sort of surrounding area. But just amazing, you know, it looked quite a nice little place. Mm, it did. It did. So, yes... Part two, coming up later on in the show, yes. watchtowers, mile castles, and Roman temples. Super oh, yes. Fun. But right now, it's time for Kate to ask... Dan Jones? Yes. What's off your needles? She's got one sock to show. It's not cricket. Look, it felt weird not having something to show you, so I do have one sock She's that cheating. I finished. So I'm cheating, and I'm going to show you that one sock in a minute. But Dan's the one that's got the glory this time. Well, not really. Because your sock is... Well, I won't show it then. No, no, do. It's too nice. Look, these are these. They're rubbish. Show yours now. No, they're not rubbish. <laughs> Dan finished his Dumbrock socks. Brian's very excited to get them. Yay. Well, at least she says she is. <sighs> She's always excited for new socks. I hope she is. She always is. And these are nice and long, so she likes long socks at the minute. They'll fit nicely underneath her... Her boots, but although she wore her boots, didn't she? She had an extra day in school um, over the holidays just to start her art GCSE project. And she wore her boots really excitedly at Doc Martin's. And her poor feet, when she got home, were like, had sore patches on. Because you've got to break them in, haven't you? The leather is really hard on them. She was fine about it. It's, it's called growing up, but we've all been yeah, there. Yeah, we've all been there yeah. to break certain shoes in, don't you? Um, but yeah, anyway. So, yeah. Dunbrock, all finished. So first time ever knitting on two and a half mil needles. I, I think, think they, they look, were two yeah, and a half mils. two and a half mil. Yeah. They look brilliant. So first time knitting on two and a half mils. And also... They're lovely. It, 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 I'd, I hadn't done a left and right before. This no. was the first left and right project yeah, I've ever done. Yeah, because the other side is just the texture. Yeah. You just get that lovely... So there was a lot of new stuff. ...design down one side of each of the socks. And the twists were unlike... The way I'd done twists yeah, before, yeah. which was great, and I, I amended the pattern slightly. I'd, some of the ribbing I did a bit longer than others. Oh, are you kidding? No, not ribbing, not ribbing. No, the ribbing's the same. Yeah, I got the ribbing right. I perfected that now no, in my. No, it didn't get the texture pattern right. It's all, over, it's all over. The, <laughs> look, look. Can anybody spot? Like, I can't even look at it. It's difficult though. It's difficult to, it's to see. I won't, I'll give them to Bryony and then I won't have to look at it. It's difficult to see, but yeah, sometimes sometimes it was three rows. Yeah. I don't know why. I you don't think I ever went over three. No, you just could, didn't ever quite get to grips with the texture pattern for some reason. I couldn't read my knitting. No. And then I, I got or off. the pattern, it seems. Well, no, I think I got off. Well, no, I could, I could read the pattern because that's, well, not on that one, it isn't. <laughs> That's right on this one, the second sock. It, it's just oh, oh. <laughs> it's just on this one. It's it's a bit weird. I mean, it's yeah. still there. It looks a bit like a tree trunk. <laughs> yeah, I'm not convinced that it's completely correct. This because look, that's right, that's right. This is not right, and this is not right. Okay. It's not very good viewing. Let's, that, I mean. No, I know. Mm. Let's let's not talk any more about Dan socks. It's but look, finished. They're I perfectly really wearable. And, and you know what this means? Brian, you will love that. This means brand new cast on. Oh yes. So yeah. when I see you next time, I will have cast on. Are you going to give them to Brian? Yes. All right, that's fine. I will have cast on a brand new pair of socks. Oh yes. Already decided what they are. Already spoken to Brian about you know. Oh, I dyed you some yarn for them. Yes, 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 yes. Yarn dyes specifically. Very exciting. Yeah. So can't wait to show you next time. Yes, personal I mean, dyed yarn. Look at this. What? Well, well, I just finished one of the Moonstruck socks. Now, <gasps> look. Now this is exciting. Starting in May, yes. Kay will be taking you through every stage of this pattern. Yes. This is going to be our big sort Isn't it of lovely. I love tutorial her. series this summer for knitting. For knitting, because of course we've got Stitchy You yes. starting after that. But. Just but yet yeah, the knitting one is the moonstruck. So you've got this lovely lace panel of beautiful moons, I think they are, or yeah. however you want to interpret them. And they, again, it just goes down one side of the sock, which that might be something you've not done before. So that'll be a, a nice new thing, maybe. 
but we will do contrast cuff, contrast heel, contrast toe. I'll go through the lace pattern with you and I'll show you all my little techniques that I do for neatening up the corners, how I cast on to, to remove the jog when you cast on how I put in the contrast colour, all of those things. And then also, obviously, we're going to work through that lovely lace pattern together. I think it'll be super fun. Yeah. So it's yeah, that starts in May. Yeah. Right. It's time to get back to Northumbria. And this is where it gets seriously exciting because after so much preamble, from this moment on... Oh, it's Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. No, he doesn't... From, <laughs> from now. From now on... <laughs> I think from now until the end of the series, there's going to be wall as far as the eye can see. Wow. And what that means is loads of amazing things to discover along the wall. So I'm going to shut up and yes. let's get on as we head back for more Walking the Wall. Welcome back to Walk in the Wall. This is most certainly it. Now on our last walk, we got very excited about 200 foot of Hadrian's Wall. How would you like nearly 100% more than that? Oh yes, because right here, there's 1,509 feet of completely unbroken wall. It's one of the longest sections on all of Hadrian's Wall and it is absolutely phenomenal. Now, because we've got such a long section of wall here, what this starts to do is open up parts of the wall we haven't yet discovered. Already in this series, we've discovered so many elements of the wall. There is, of course, the vallum that used to protect the southern side of the wall. There's the defensive ditch, which we found last time, which used to sit right in front of the wall. There's the wall itself, there's forts, but also what you find along the wall are what's called mile castles. Now, mile castles were manned by about well, it's between 16 and 32 legionaries, and they used to then look after a one mile section of wall. But what I had no idea about until we planned this series was in between those mile castles, there was something called watchtowers. And the watchtowers were every third of a mile. So you had a mile castle every mile, and then every third of a mile you had a watchtower. And one of the most famous on all of Hadrian's Wall is just up here. Welcome everyone to Black Cart's Turret. Now not much of this remains today, but just take a look at what this looked like when it was manned by a select crew of Roman legionaries. Now, many excavations have taken place here over the years and loads of things have been found from coins to millstones. So soldiers were definitely grinding corn here, most probably to make their lunch or their tea. But there was no beds here. The beds were actually a nearby mile castle, which we're gonna have a walk past a little bit later on in the walk. But there are still some tangible glimpses, some little bits of evidence of the life that once used to be led here by those Roman legionaries. Just take a look at this. Do you see that groove in the stone here? This is the lintel for the door that used to let people come in and out of the turret. And that groove there was made by 
the metal slider that you would slide into place once the door was shut. And like so many times, I, I can recall being in houses with doors like this, I think my mum's got one like this, you don't fully secure it when it's up, so when it comes back into place, it slides across the stone. And over the years, it's actually ground out that channel, and then that was where it was secured. I mean, talk about a tangible piece of evidence, history that you can really touch of the people that once used to work here. Just amazing. What's so exciting now is we're gonna to get to walk in the footsteps of the men who used to man Black Cart's turret because their shift is over. It's time for a well-earned rest. And to get that, we need to get back to the place that we're stationed at on the wall. And that's our mile castle. And it's just a short walk in this direction. And there is a very good reason for that. When Hadrian was growing up, he was absolutely obsessed with the stories of the Greek writer Homer. He loved Greek things so much, his family nicknamed him Graeculus, which means little Greek. When he got a little bit older and he was sort of in his 19, 20 years old, he actually, he worked in Athens in the very first sort of early part of his working career. So he was working in the capital of Greece. This was long before he was chosen, of course, to be the future emperor. But when that time came, when he did become emperor, it's no surprise that some of the decisions that he took and that he made reflected his love of everything to do with Greece. So we're well on our way to Mile Castle 30, our bed for the night. And along the route, we're gonna see something which is pretty unbelievable in my experience of Romans. Because Romans, when they wanted to do something, they just did it. Hadrian's Wall is the perfect example. 73 miles from coast to coast, there's rivers to cross, there's mountain ranges to clear, done. And that's the case for the wall. That's the case for the vallum. But do you remember the defensive ditch, which we were so excited to find last walk? Well, actually, if you just take a look here, it's right behind me now as I'm walking along. Would you believe that just up ahead, it just stops? <laughs> now, there's no rhyme or reason, there's no explanation. The only one that I can come to is this. It was 5 p.m. on a Friday. They didn't want to pay overtime, so they just downed tools and left. That's what it looks like. Now, the one thing that we can be sure of, and I think that's what makes this bit of the wall so cool, is the soldiers that walked back from Blackheart's turret on their way to Mile Castle 30 would have seen this absolutely every time they came past. 
And like I mentioned earlier on in the walk, you can absolutely bet that they used to look down and laugh at it, because everything about Rome was regimented, apart from this. Let's see if we can find it. You do really get a sense of how hard this job must have been when they were cutting this ditch. It, it doesn't make any sense though why it stops because the same section of geology just you know 50 60 foot in that direction there is the vallum which is much deeper than this and there's two bits to it and that carries on no problem but but here it just stops and no one really knows why. Perhaps it was just a bad day at the office. What's so cool is you can still see in the rocks the stone workings that were done by the Romans to split these huge boulders in two and also to move them around. If you look at that circular one, that would have been used to shift the stones. But then you'll also find just superb like carved marks out, 2,000 year old Roman stonemason marks. It really is fascinating stuff. I love it. And just a few hundred feet from the mess that is Limestone Corner, you find our bed for the night, which was Mile Castle 30. I wonder too if the soldiers who worked here felt isolated because this is actually the farthest north because the, the wall sort of snakes backwards and forwards a little bit but this is the farthest north that it actually gets so this really was the absolute edge of the empire but I'm guessing they didn't feel isolated and the reason for that is their mile castle was sat just back there and then half a mile, well, yeah, it's about half a mile walk to their home, which is of course the place where we started our walk today, Broccolicia Roman Fort. And there's one part of that fort, which is the most unique and it's what makes Broccolicia so important. And I didn't show it to you and I've not actually seen it yet. And I'm very excited to see it. It's a Roman temple and I've never seen one before ever, not in situ. So to say that I'm excited to get back to Broccolicia, I'm sure just like the soldiers who'd finished their, their night shift at Black Cart's turret, this is it, it's the home straight now. You can feel your family and your bed, it's on the horizon. Let's get back to Broccolicia and see if we can find this amazing Roman temple. Some of those gods and goddesses became popular all across the empire. And one of the most popular was the god of Mithras. He became assimilated into the Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses. And he was originally actually a Persian god. But over the course of time, 
he became one of the most popular gods in all of the Roman Empire. The worship of Mithras became hugely popular with the Roman army, most probably because they too thought they were permanently at war with evil. Temples were built close to forts so that soldiers could come and pay their respects on their days off. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's only one of these temples left, or certainly that's been found along all of Hadrian's Wall. And I think it's just down here. My goodness, after catching sight of an altar on all of our walks so far this series, it's absolutely wonderful to finally be stood inside the place where these things would once have been stood because this is the Mithraic temple here at Brocolicia Fort. And it's got just an aura about it. As soon as you walk into it, the acoustics change. And it's crazy because the top's missing because each god had a temple that was specific to them. And Mithraic temples were designed to be very small and very cramped so that it felt like the cave that Mithras went in to slay the bull. At the start of the ceremony, the whole place would be in complete darkness, apart from a candle which would be lit behind one of the altars down here and some little holes where the light would have shone through. Just take a look at this, it's fascinating stuff. There they are. So the candle would have been behind there and you can just imagine the sort of flickering light coming through and it probably would have given off, you know, a real aura of light within this very small space. Now, towards the end of the ceremony, that's when the bull was slayed and the, you know, the, the positiveness came in, the light. It was the light conquering over the dark and it was up there. Up there, there was a curtain and someone at the back of the temple would draw open that curtain and then the whole place would be flooded with light. It's the first time I've ever been into a Roman temple anywhere. I don't even recall getting into one when I visited Rome. This is amazing. I think you'll agree that is the perfect way to finish our walk today. And what a walk this has been. The thing that I've loved so much about this walk is the connection that we've made with the people who once used to live and work here. Because of course we visited Black Cart's turret where so many soldiers over the hundreds of years that this fort and wall was manned would have gone to work. We then came back past the mess that was Limestone Corner where you can just imagine them looking down at that and laughing when you consider the precision that Romans used to take in everything. You could bet that that was spoken about 
out by all the people who once lived and worked here. And then finally, we visited the Temple of Mithras, where those men would have gone to worship on their days off. It's been really just such a lovely experience and visiting here for the first time. I'm so frustrated I've not been before, but you can rest assured I'm gonna be coming back. And we, of course, are gonna be coming back for more walks along the wall because, ladies and gentlemen, this has all been the preamble. This has been the appetizer, the starter, before the main course, because when I see you next time, I'm gonna be taking you to the heights of Hadrian's Wall. Yes, the highest fort on all of the wall, the majestic housesteads. But that's all to come in our next walk. So all that remains for me to do is to thank you so much for joining me on this wonderful walk and I'll see you next time for more Walking the Wall. Now that was a walk and a half, wasn't it? Oh, I loved it. I hope. I wish I'd been there, kind of. Well, <laughs> you would love the walk. Yes. But what you don't enjoy is the production no. elements of things. And so that's cool. And also though as well, it just it works beautifully now for us, this 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 balance with you focusing on mm, your mm, Coast Coast Kitchen mm. and my favourite colourways and I focus on walking the wall or whatever yeah, yeah. outdoor filming that we're doing. But just getting to that watchtower and seeing mm. that groove mm. in, I mean... It's very tangible history, isn't it? And, and often <sighs> history is not tangible. What freaks um, me out about that is, if you go around your house, you'll find loads of things that you've done to yeah, your house yeah. inadvertently. And that is exactly what happened there. Yeah. That was someone's workplace. Over 328 years, you know, lots of different people will have gone mm. into there to work there for the day. And they'll have done that on their way in and on their way out. Mm. And mm. to be able to go there and put your fingers in it like I did, it's like, we don't know exactly who those people were, but my goodness, do you feel connected to mm -hmm. them? But then also then setting off, walking on that section of wall was outstanding. Mm. It was just amazing. We've driven past it so many times. We've always seen it so many mm. times. Like, oh my goodness, we, look at we, that. Yeah, we Suddenly see it it's there. Every time, because it's very close to Housesteads, isn't it? And, you know, to, to suddenly be there walking along it, it was just wonderful. And Limestone Corner, you know, it's another example of tangible history. Mm. You sort of understanding, no one will really know why they just stopped. Why they just stopped. We were talking about this the other day after yeah, Kay watched we it, were. and they'll have just hit some geology. It's that got was like, to be the it's got to be the geology, you would think, hasn't it? I read one history book that I really liked, and their sort of justification was this. They would have gone through whatever they needed to go through on the south side of the wall because that was the Roman side. Mm. That was the side that was going to be seen by the Romans and it needed to look perfect. On the barbarian side, if we hit something tricky in a patch where no one's going to attack anyway, we're just going to stop. We don't care if it looks rubbish. That's probably what happened. I because the Romans are not going to be looking at it mm. properly. The mm. only way that you would see that bit is looking over the top of the wall mm. and looking down onto it. But like I said, you can rest assured, you know what it's like where things are a bit weird. You can just imagine them walking past mm. and laughing on their way past. Yeah. What is that? That's crazy. But then getting in that temple and seeing yeah. where the candles... The candle used to shine through. Amazing. Just the, little things like that, I think. It's just... Yeah, fascinating. I'd, I'd obviously read about that because I've never been to that temple before, and I was slightly sceptical. I was sort of thinking, "I oh, know it won't be that obvious. Mm, you know, you, mm. you won't be able to see it. it won't be. Mm. But there it was. Mm. There's the holes, and like, you know, clearly candle behind, and yeah, yeah. just amazing. W what a walk! What a walk! But it really is the the, the preamble, the precursor, because Housesteads is. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, we've been to Housesteads several times and we've actually stayed literally in Housesteads. There's a, a farmhouse you can rent there and we've stayed there and we love it at Housesteads. What we're going to be doing on the next walk is we're going to be coming past Housesteads, coming down to the, it's a mile castle. Yeah. Where 
our daughter Bryony and I sat and had a picnic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll be coming through that mar castle. We're actually walking straight through that mar castle and then straight down yeah. the bank. Which we've done. No, no. Oh, no, we haven't no, done. No, 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 no. Straight through the mile castle, out through the wall, oh, to down the, other the side. bank. Oh, right. Into the moorland. So you'd be going north. Across to the lake. Oh, right. That you okay. can see. I know no, we haven't done that before. Walking back to the wall and then picking up the military way back right. up to okay. Housesteads. Okay. And we'll be taking a look at the, at the Vicus there, which is a really famous one because... There was a murder there. Oh, that's right. I remember, and, yeah. and no one knew up until an archaeological dig was done in about 1950. Mm. And in the pub, <laughs> in this you know Roman settlement, they found a body under the floorboards. Under the floorboards, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So that's all to come next time. But yes. on our next show, Kay's Cozy Kitchen is back. Yeah. And to say that I'm excited about this episode. Yes. <laughs> There's going to be things it's, going on in this episode. We won't say what. No, it's, it's one of our very, very favourite things. It's one of our I, very favourite things. Make, but you're doing um, something else. Doing something else which, alongside it that will just lift it to the <laughs> stratosphere, hopefully. Kate's going to be doing something which I used to do when I was a kid. And I've, at the moment, never done but lots of practising and experimenting and things going Amazing, on. amazing. Yeah. It's going yeah. to be amazing. Right now then, it's time for the Endy Bits. End Bits. Now then, we're getting ready for a patron-only show and a half. Yes. Because... Very exciting. We're going to be joined by the composer of the music you just heard in Walking the Wall. He also composed the music for my favourite colourways yeah and also Case Handmade Christmas yeah and New Adventures of the Bakery Bears yeah and so many more things that we've done over the years he's joining us for a live interview he is we've already had questions submitted which we're going to be putting to him but then well, I'm sure we'll have yeah, time I'm probably sure. for a couple of I'm sure off the cuff questions from, free for from the audience for anyone yeah. who's watching live but this is our patron only exclusive show it's on Sunday the 24th of April if you're watching live it will be at 2pm British summer time but then you can watch the show and you can watch any of our patron only shows anytime yeah. you like that particular show, though, will be available to watch any time you like from 10 past three yeah. on the 24th of April. Yeah, and that is, of course, we've not said who that person is. It's my brother. <laughs> it's Dan's brother, but Dom. For, for, no, it's not my brother. It's the world-famous composer, Mr Dominic Jones. Yes. Yes, who just happens to be also Dan's my brother. brother. Yes. <laughs> He's also my current drumming pupil. Yes. Yes. Dan's been teaching him to drum. It's been brilliant. You've really loved it. And it's it's kind of got you... It's been brilliant, actually, because Dan's been upstairs back drumming. And Well, I, I have drummed. You, you have I've, drummed. I drum for him regularly. You do, yeah. But it's not something that you've done kind of, you know as part of your normal no. routine sort of thing. No, no. And I was in the shower the other night and I got out of the shower and I could hear Dan playing. And well, I was like... What, oh. what, what's happened and is... And he was playing BTS. What, what's happened is... It's brilliant. It, I, I think actually the, the explanation which gets to the nub of the issue is my drums have been set up in a way where Kay couldn't hear what was going on. Yeah. That's the difference. Because the, the kit you've got upstairs is an electronic kit, isn't it? Y yes, yes. The, the way that I... Because I, I regularly record music for my brother, mm. who's coming on for the interview on Sunday. And the, the way that that's done is it, it's done all electronically. Mm. And mm. it's done in a way which is unbelievably clever and, and slick, but it's totally silent. So mm. anyone who doesn't have on a pair of headphones can't hear yeah. what's going on whereas now I've set it up in a way yeah. where it can be heard and that's the first time I've done that in quite a number of years oh, it's so, so I have been able to sit down and play myself but not not so that I could perform. actually perform yeah but it, it just took me back you know and I sort of crept out of the shower like this and I looked around the corner into the other room and I didn't want him to know that I was watching and it was just like I said to you afterwards that it just transported me back to being sort of 31, 32 when we first met and I went to your quite a lot of the gigs that you did and just remember watching you and just being like, oh my gosh, you know. Just ama it was just just amazing to watch because you just looked and sounded exactly the same, you know, and it's like not a day had passed. 
when, when in effect it's like 19 years or whatever, 18, 19 years. It was just so lovely. It just maybe, and I said to you after, I said, you've got to do this more often. Oh, yeah, because yeah. Because this is who you are, you know. Well, this is a part of who you are, I guess. And, you know, people change and evolve and you, you move on to different things, don't you? And your focus might not be on something it was previously. Yeah. But I could see it in your face, you know. It just lit you up and you, you were back in... I don't, I, it just really felt right just to see you behind the drums. It was oh, just yeah, so well, lovely. I, I, I agree with, with, with Kay in, in that. Uh, it's the whole reason why I've set things up in the way that I've set them up now. Mm. But, you know, you, you, you do change. And what's changed for me, and I'm so glad that it's changed, is that I don't have the urge or the remotest desire to, to, go, to out go out and play. No. And to perform. No anymore no because i did it for you did it for a long ages. you did, did it from it when you years. were 14 I up until 20 I, I did it for probably 15 years yeah and that is long enough <laughs> yeah longer than 15 years yeah. it must have been it's longer but anyways like humping a long time it's very physical gear in and out of places yeah, because you obviously used acoustic drums to do that so his gear went in and you were the i think the drummer is the one that's got the most stuff you know you play a guitar put it in the box off you yeah. go yeah, yeah. or a violin or what, you know yeah. whatever but the drummer has got to like pack down everything put it oh i was used so, to like I remember when I used to play shows. Yeah. There used to be this one lady who used to play shows. She was a clarinetist, and uh, we always used to laugh at her because she would literally, you know, the, the, the conductor would yeah. finish conducting, and before he'd put down his baton, this woman <laughs> would have a clarinet back in the box, and she'd be on the way out of the door of the theatre yeah. on her way home. I hadn't even put my drumsticks away, and she's gone. But as I've got older, I do get that. I do get it more and more because, yeah. you know, you want to be where you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to be there anymore. So no, and that's, that's why great, I get, but you I, do still enjoy playing. And oh, that's, yeah. That's great that, you you know, you can still play, I think. Yeah, the, the important element to it is you being able to hear what's going on. Absolutely, it was brilliant. You played BTS and then what else did you play? Uh, Russell Watson. Oh, Russell Watson, yes. Oh, the Enterprise theme. I also played some Steve Winwood. yeah. It was great. It. We had a little concert, you know, after my shower, and Bryony was in the bath downstairs here, and she could hear as well. And she's like, "Oh, I could hear." I was in the bath, and I was like, "I could hear BTS." It was great. <laughs> Folks, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everybody. And yes, we're so looking forward to seeing you in two weeks with uh, Kay's Cozy yes. Kitchen. Lots in store over Yummy. the next two weeks for our Baker Bear patrons. And just while I'm mentioning patrons, please do consider becoming a Baker Bear patron. Yes. Because if you have enjoyed Walking the Wall, if you enjoy Cozy Kitchen, if you'd like to watch the patron only show, if you enjoy what we do and you want to empower us to do more and, you know, do more amazing and cool yeah. and exciting yeah. things, then please sign up, become a patron. You can read our magazine too, yeah. which has an interview in it actually. A few episodes ago, you, remember, you, you mentioned Rachel... Rachel Borello yeah. Carol, I think is her full name. Yeah. Uh, we interviewed her oh, in, in Knitability. Right. I can't remember exactly which issue, but if you go to our read page on our website, you can look back through all the issues and it says on the front of the right. issue who's Brilliant. being interviewed. In fact, I think he, a Yarnigan might be on the front oh, right. of one of the issues. She was lovely. Yeah, she was great. Sure. She must be if she designs cute little yes. things like that. <laughs> Folks, that's it. That's enough. <laughs> we will see you in yes. two weeks for more. Have fun, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. Bye. Bye. It's sitting and knitting. It's done and Kate will take a repress. Enthusiasm's not quitting. It's done and Kate will take a repress. They'll take you to fabulous places of which they're famous. Yourself in a castle